All right, like I said, I'm with the Southern Colorado SBDC. This week is Small Business Week. So we feature promotions for Small Business Week. We bring mm -hmm. awareness to small businesses. Um, this is the week that I ask everybody, please support a small business. If you don't normally support, try to support some a small business this week. But always, whenever you can, shop small. Because 75 cents of every dollar when you buy from a small business owner stays in our community. When you buy from a big box or a larger type of organization, 45 cents stays in our community. So just by helping for every dollar, we help our community to grow and prosper, which leads to our mission statement is to help new and existing businesses grow and prosper. And our vision is we want to be the premier trusted choice of Colorado businesses for consulting. Um, and assistance that they need. We're a national organization and we have over a thousand offices nationwide, 14 offices here in Colorado. We are the largest small business support network um, in the country. Our SBDC is ranked in the top 10 of the United States uh, right now because we did win the state and regional award for innovation and excellence. We had to hand that title off to another center that did a really good program this year, but we still maintain our spot in the top 10. So we're really proud of that. We focus on three main services to help small businesses, free one-on-one -on -one counseling, coaching, whatever you want to call it, consulting. Each of our consultants has a specialty area that they can support you in. All of them have general business support, but we have someone who works strictly with startups. We have someone who works strictly to review e-commerce sites and help you get that started. Someone to work on business plans. Someone who's a retired banker so he can help you get prepared for your loans, for whatever finances you're looking for. Everybody always asks me, well, I don't want a loan. I want grants. Hey, I'm here to tell you, grants are very hard to find nowadays, all right? You can only find a grant really when you look at it. If you're doing something for infrastructure, broadband, or some type of child education care right now, those are the grants that are still out there functioning. Uh, we also do a lot of free, uh, low cost educational classes. Not all of our classes cost money. Uh, most of them are free. There are minimal charges now that we grants have gone away. We do need to make sure that we charge that, but we do accounting, business soft skills training, we do CDOT training, we do leading edge, uh, look to see a few more cybersecurity AI classes that will be popping up. We are also your resource connector. Uh, we can help you with gaining capital, uh, finding those loans, scaling up, et cetera. Kevin's gonna pass out, well, I don't know if we're gonna pass them out, but we have some packets here that in this back of the packet, there is a grant, even though I just said that there's no grants. This is a very interesting program. Came out onto our office on Wednesday of last week. Okay, you have to apply tomorrow <laughs> or by the 3rd of May. And 71 $5,000 grants for underserved communities. But it says right here, first come, first serve. So that means you've got to make sure that you're ready to apply and have everything ready tomorrow when it opens at 10 a.m. Okay, and so there's a link where you can see if you qualify. If you're a government agency, you can't apply. If you're a nonprofit, you can't apply. But if you're a small local business, $5,000 um, can help. Uh, but like I said, first 71, so competition is going to be pretty uh, heavy for that one. All right, so like I said, it's Small Business Week. We have information uh, slides over here, uh, paper printouts for you. For all of our events that we have coming up, uh, Catherine and I are in all four counties we serve this week, plus we uh, will be tomorrow at San Diego Cristo Arts and Conference Center, uh, giving resources to artists that need help turning their art into a business. Thursday's business resources that we're going to do, but I'm inviting you all on Friday 
to our small business expo and hiring fair. We have 60 people signed up that day. Um, we have a lot of foot traffic that goes out there. This is a good time to meet those e-commerce businesses that generally aren't just out there for you to always see where you know with the foot traffic, things like that. So we support a lot of uh, smaller businesses that are just getting started like that. Okay, there's the grant that I brought up. And then the SBDC is part of Pueblo Community College. So we have a free leadership development training series that we're working with them right now. So in May, we've got three classes coming up, time management. Um, what are the two you're teaching, Catherine? Uh, workplace ethics yeah. and teamwork. Yeah. Um, they also have a free heavy equipment operations um, class coming up. Um, and then the corporate college, if you're wanting to learn something new or you're wanting to uh, upskill your skills, um, they do have some scholarships to help you get some type of training. You need to reach out to them. They'll help you get that. And then they also have, if you're a small business owner and you are looking to train your workforce, but you can't afford it, they have what is called the Pueblo, um, it's the skills grant. And so what they do is they work with small businesses. You can't be a hospitality and you can't be a government entity, but any other small business, if you need training, you speak with Mr. Izzy Ogas here and he will help develop that training. It's a reimbursement grant. So you pay for the training first, but then the OEDIT office reimburses you for that training. So he just got some training for the zoo. They needed special animal handle, handling training. They've got that. He works with Evra's, all sorts of small businesses to help you with that training. Okay, so Pueblo Corporate College, you can go to their website. We can give you that information. Uh, we'll be in the back of the room, but we can help internships, apprenticeships, work-based learning opportunities. Like I said, that scholarship is from the city of Pueblo. They've gotten a grant with Workforce, so it covers up to $600 of a training class for you if you want to take that. You have to fill out their application on their website, but the best thing is to email Izzy uh, for Pueblo, um, and then you can email Ariana for Canyon City if you need that. All right, um, I think that is all I have today. And now we got Mr. Aidens coming up to say something. Sure, well, hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, the SBDC, there, there's a lot of great uh, great things uh, coming out of the SBDC in, in our community, Southern Colorado. Um, but first off, uh, I'm Aiden Martinez. I'm the Business Development Coordinator here at the Latino Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you all for showing up. This is actually one of the most packed rooms ever since I've been on. Uh, so glad to see a lot of friendly faces. Um, once again, thank you to the SBDC with Brian and Catherine, um, our AI connections, our AI integrations. <coughs> um, thank you for sh showing up and telling us a little bit more about uh, what we'll be learning today. And uh, to Jeff uh, from uh, Public Web Design, mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. So. A lot of a uh, lot of hope in small business, and with that, we're moving into the future. So I'm looking forward to what's next. I believe. Yep. Yep. So we're going to introduce Jeff Miller, Public Web Design. He's going to give you a presentation on AI. Thank you very much. Doctor, can you hook me up? Here? Yep. Uh, thanks for having me, everybody. And good to see some familiar faces. Um, I'm the owner of Pueblo Web Design, and uh, my office is just half a block away uh, next to Mr. Tandori. So uh, I, I love it when. Do you want to just uh, yeah, you can throw it on up. Uh, I'm always available to chat in person, which is something I think uh, makes my company unique. Um, oftentimes, we don't know if our web designer is out of the country or. Uh, you know, I like to say working in the dorm room. Uh, what I get a lot of is our web designer doesn't answer the phone. He disappeared, doesn't respond to our emails. And so a big part of my business is taking over websites from other companies and managing my, my client's uh, web presence. Um, so what I'd like to demonstrate first is how I use AI in my business. Um, I'll be very brief and then I'll introduce Spencer and, and how our relationship grew. Um, so, uh, 
in web design, one struggle with my business is um, guiding my clients through content generation. <laughs> If they have a current website and I'm rebuilding it, that makes my life easier because I'm pretty much copying and pasting their content over into a new website. Well, they will often go through a review process and submit new material. But for the average small business owner, that's a real challenge. And I work with a lot of small mom and pop type stores, plumbers, electricians, or tradesmen. They don't have time uh, to write up all this content. And they're not familiar with search engine optimization tactics and really better serve letting a professional handle the content. Of course, things like their About Us page, we like to have some personal content, really should come from them. And more complicated businesses, uh, it's always best coming from the business owner. But when they don't have time, um, and it just won't happen, our projects come to a screeching halt. And I have websites that have just stopped because a client just doesn't have the time or the energy to provide me with the content. I can't generate it and things just don't get done or they get done halfway. Um, so a um, couple things, um, I wanna show you an example of what we're talking about. Timmy Electric, he is um, an electrician and perfect example of he just did not have a lot of time, pretty much all he supplied me was with his logo and phone number, and uh, he was trying to attract different areas in which he served to show up better on search engines. To show up better on search engines, we need content for Google to read the content and know what your website is about. Um, so if I was to click through his services, um, each page just had a little blurb about the services and um, an image. These are really, really short blurbs. And there's actually, uh, they're a little bit more if I was to scroll down. Let me find a little better page. Um, so what the way it works is I generated all this content using uh, chat GPT and then uh, brought it into his website. I shared a preview with him, which he could have the option of changing or accepting the content that was currently on his website and it moved the project along much quicker. And so if you're not familiar with chat GPT, it's just a basic tool that anybody can use. And you can see here, I just typed in a question, tell me about electrical services and it does the work for me. So this is just super basic intro to how I use AI technology for my company. Now, as a side note, part of my company, I'm pretty much a one man band. I have a social media manager that I just hired my first employee. Um, but we have a lot of related services to web design, like Google AdWords, search engine optimization, social media, and now AI. Um, I like to find professionals in my industry to partner with. When I do partner with companies like AI Integrations, I'd like you to know that um, I make an introduction and you work directly with that partner. I don't uh, play middleman and upsell that product and charge you more and make money that way. I think it's a very honest way of doing business and a, a very honest way to treat my clients to provide the best services. So I don't sell products like search engine optimization, but I have a professional partner that uh, manages all my clients and we make an introduction. And, and so I'd like to show you a little bit um, about my chat feature on my website, which is right here on every page. Now it says that I'm offline, so we're missing out on any chats right now. If somebody was to wanna chat with me, they'd have to call or send me a message. The other downside of that is I have to have one screen. I have three screens in my office setup. One of those screens is just dedicated to my chat feature. And so I always have to be in front of that. And I, I offer this option to most of my clients, depending on their business, and they really just don't want it because they can't be in front of their computer all the time. Um, it's a free service, but and, you know, like everything, you get something for free, but they want you to upgrade. So there's lots of limitations with it. 
Um, and to tell you the truth, I really just use this as a lead generation tool. I do get quite a few people that would like to chat using that. And I always say, I'd like to learn more about your business. Can you please give me a call? Um, because it's just not a great way for me to educate the client on the services. I like to do something in person. Um, but um, this kind of comes where, where I'll leave off because I still use this on my website because I'm the type of business that's in front of my computer all the time. It kind of works for me, um, but honestly, it doesn't work great for my clients. So when Spencer from AI Integrations um, contacted me and gave me a demonstration of his product, which we have on our website, um, you can play with that tool under AI chat. And you can get go ahead and give it a test and uh, ask questions, you know, and when he'll tell you more about this, but when people write in questions, um, we track what people are asking about, so we can always refine the technology and we get copies of this information. And for some companies, we've all seen it now, it can be a little frustrating when you need support. Um, we have a client that's using this that you can ask for a human and it'll provide you with contact information for a human. So you're not stuck in AI world. But it's so smart, and he'll explain more about this, is that the idea is to take some of the workload off your hands and allow this software to work 24 seven when you're not in front of it to answer a personal chat. Um, this technology is a really great resource. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Spencer from AI Integrations, uh, who partners with me. Thank you for the introduction, Jeff. I am Spencer Thompson. I'm here on behalf of a Colorado-based software and AI company called AI Integrations. I'm just briefly going to switch over to my PowerPoint and we'll get started. So again, I am Spencer Thompson. I'm here today. Oh, clicker, clicker. Is that one? That's why we have business partners. <laughs> so good morning, everyone, and thank you for your time this morning. I'm Spencer Thompson. I'm the CEO and founder of a Colorado-based software and AI company called AI Integrations. Our mission is to help small businesses utilize AI to benefit their business. I'd like to briefly, briefly give you an agenda slash overview of how I'd like to spend our time today. I first want to start off by explaining what is AI. <laughs> AI is this term that's being thrown around a lot recently, but I'd like to decomplicate the technology of AI. Then I would like to talk about how AI has had its rising role in modern business. A lot of us might think that artificial intelligence has come out of nowhere, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Then I would like to talk about my company and our mission of democratizing AI technology. The big tech companies have used AI for a long time. I believe it is now time for small businesses to benefit from this same technology. After that, we'll have a short breakout session on the note of ChatGBT actually, and we're gonna have a session to focus on our skills and using ChatGBT most effectively as a small business owner. After that, I'd like to discuss AI and small business in particular, and the applications I see being most fitting for small businesses. Then we'll briefly discuss the future of AI, where I see the technology going and improving to, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions and answers at the end. On that note, we've got a decently small group here today. If you have any question or anything I'm saying is really confusing, feel free to throw up a hand. Don't worry about messing up my flow or anything. I'd love to answer your question. So let's start off. What is AI? AI stands for artificial intelligence. When I hear the word artificial, I think of simulated. When I hear the word intelligence, I think of knowledge or intellect. So when I hear artificial intelligence, I think of simulated knowledge or intellect. And as a matter of fact, most dictionary definitions of AI currently are going to tell you something along those lines. Simulated knowledge and intellect. So how do we simulate this knowledge with artificial intelligence? 
We use data and large data sets. This begs the question, what is data? <clears throat> There's a really long dictionary definition that I'm not even gonna actually try to read to you guys right now. But for me, I think the most useful definition of data for our purposes here today is anything capable of being recorded, no, no, no. anything capable of being recorded by a computer, i.e. a picture, a website, a Word document, a spreadsheet, all of these are data that AI can build off of. So with this in mind, how many variables does it take for a computer program to become an artificial intelligence? A simple computer program like two plus two equals four is a calculator. We don't consider that artificial intelligence as a society. However, this is computer simulated knowledge. So I ask you, where do we draw the line? I'd like to give a few examples of that so we can help discuss it, as I don't believe there's a clear black and white in today's society. Like I said, two plus two equals four is a simple mathematical equation. However, this is using data and a computer to simulate knowledge. <clears throat> Most of us are not gonna consider this artificial intelligence. Let's make that algorithm much, much, much more complicated. And let's add thousands of variables. Let's do a Kelly Blue Book used car value. This is taking into account the paint color of your car, the interior, whether you have a sunroof or not, mileage, and more. However, this is still a mathematical equation. Is this starting to become more of an artificial intelligence? For me, I'm going to say 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a no. That's the math equation. Kelly Blue Book simulating the used car value. That's more of a machine learning. And then as we start to approach the Netflix algorithm and Instagram algorithms, now we're into clearly into the territory of artificial intelligence. The Netflix and Instagram algorithms use millions of variables to determine what is going to captivate our attention most effectively. These algorithms are inherently AI and are the most profitable and cutting edge versions of AI we see in modern society today. Self-driving technology is another thing that I'm sure has come to the mind of a lot of us here in this room already. Tesla's self-driving technology is indeed an AI. However, I would like to say, believe it or not, that AI takes less computer programming than something like the Netflix or Instagram algorithms. I know that might blow some minds here in the room. Hmm. So let me then ask you, if Tesla's self-driving is AI and we're kind of iffy on complex algorithms like the Instagram one, why is Tesla self-driving an AI, but the Instagram algorithm isn't? Does it have something to do with the inherent consequences of this computer program going wrong? Is that where we as humans start to identify this as an artificial intelligence now? Furthermore, 20 years ago, the idea of a robot that would do chores for you was undoubtedly artificial intelligence. We have things that do that nowadays. We have a Roomba that can vacuum and sweep and mop for you. Is this chore not enough to be considered artificial intelligence? What if your Roomba made you dinner? Would you then consider it artificial intelligence? Why? As a matter of fact, that Roomba could make dinner with less computer code than something like the Instagram algorithm. So this, and one final point I'd like to make is a lot of people said, well, they'll never pass complicated human, you know, AIs. Well, it's an AI once it can pass a complicated human test. Like, the MCATs or the bar or something really hard that you know people go to school for seven years for, eight, nine more. And I'd like to let you know that the current artificial intelligences will pass both the MCAT and the bar in the top 10 percentile nationwide. Right now. So where do you draw the line? I think this is a personal question. There is no definite answer. I'd love to chat with you as much as you want about it afterwards. Um, let's ask another question. What is AGI? Show of hands, who here in the room has even heard of the term AGI? Cool. So that stands for artificial general intelligence. And when, when we watch things like Terminator or iRobot or those sci-fi movies that depict AI, they're not depicting AI as we've defined it. They're depicting AGI, artificial general intelligence. The key distinguishing factor here is AI as we have it currently is able to perform better than a human across a narrow range of tasks. So we have an AI that's trained to perform math calculations better than humans, so to speak. That's a narrow scope. AGI is such a fringe term that Merriam-Webster and other dictionaries haven't tried to define it yet. However, the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, has defined AGI, and I would like to read a quote on that note to give you what I believe is the def definition of AGI. AGI's artificial general intelligence is a type of AI that can perform well or better than a human across a wide range of cognitive tasks. 
This is in contrast to things like ChatGPT currently with a narrow scope of specific tasks. AGI is the goal of a lot of these big AI companies, and AGI is a term to describe that pers personified robot. We do not have an AGI yet, to be very clear. So I'd like to talk about how we got to where we are with AI and modern business. A lot of us might think it showed up out of nowhere, like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> it's actually been around for over 60 years. So AI as a term was first coined in 1956 when a team at Dartmouth was researching how to most effectively use this new tool called a computer. They uh, laid the foundational groundwork for basic computational logic, comparison logic, and basic algorithms that would later go on to be known as the birth of AI. For the next about 30 years until 1986, there was no major developments in artificial intelligence. Until in 1986, back propagation and advanced neural networks were developed. I'll be near that for you. Most modern computing tasks, we have multiple chips to thank for. It's not just the chip in your phone, there's multiple chips in your phone that allow for things to happen. This is a neural network of computers talking to each other to create this more intelligent computer. So in 1986 was the first time as humans we were able to kind of combine chips into a network of computing power. With that, in 1989, a man named Yan Li Chun worked for a company called Bell Labs, and he developed the first modern and practical use of AI that we use every day. He developed a system where an AI could look at a check, verify the signature, verify the numbers, and turn that into real machine data for a bank. This system would then go on to become the check depositing systems we all use today. That was developed in 1989. Very primitive, but the starting of that was in 1989. Then in 1997, I'm sure some of us in this room can remember this, IBM took a challenge to beat the world chess champion at chess. This man's name was Gary Kasparov. It was widely considered in society at that point in time. We've seen various polls, but probably around 80 to 90% of people from what I've seen did not think that a computer could possibly beat the human at chess. IBM used machine learning and cutting edge AI technology at the time on a project called Deep Blue to indeed beat Gary Kasparov at chess in 1997 marking a key milestone for artificial intelligence. In 2010, IBM introduced IBM Watson, which pop popularized AI in business. I IBM Watson is IBM's natural language processing software. software. I'll be nerd in natural language processing for you all. Natural language processing is a computer's ability to understand human speech. So until about 2010, only the big tech companies were fringely trying these things, a, a computer to understand human speech. But in 2010, IBM released an enterprise version of IBM Watson, allowing for big companies like Home Depot, AT&T, T-Mobile to start having computer software that understood human speech. I'm sure you'll remember around this time in 2010, 2011 was the introduction of the, if you please repeat that phone line, press one for, press two for, and the, our lower grade chatbots. A lot of my customers and what I do have a negative connotation of chatbots, because their first experience of it was probably in 2010 to 2014. You know, it's a very simplistic natural language processing software. We have come miles and miles, and we have hundreds of times of the computing power in natural language processing here in 2024. In 2024, well, in the 2020s, we've seen a widespread AI adoption. We now, your, your everyday person is hearing about terms like AI, AGI, chat GPT, and companies like OpenAI are becoming some of the most valuable companies out there. This is the evolution of AI and business to get us to where we are today. I'd like to briefly talk about my AI journey and what's kind of given me some of this background knowledge and why I'm passionate to talk about AI with you guys this morning. So in 2014, I founded a machine learning company that had millions and millions of data points on used cars. In 2014, there was nothing that would allow a car sale or a car dealership to see the used value of a car at auction. We're all familiar with Kelly Blue Book, and I used it as an example earlier. Kelly Blue Book shows us the retail price of a car on the street. Dealerships obviously don't pay that. And so in 2014, there's no software that allowed that. I spent two years developing this software, mined millions and millions and millions of characters of data, and it really laid, laid the groundwork for my understanding of machine learning and artificial intelligence. For the six years after uh, 
I started machine learning uh, or played with machine learning in Los Angeles. I would move back to Colorado and become a mountain guide. I would work part time as a web developer, always staying in touch with the tech community and you know buying the newest computer and looking for the newest softwares. I was always in touch with that, but I did spend about six years working as a mountain guide in Colorado. Um, and then in 2022, this fringe niche product at the time came out called ChatGPT. No one had used ChatGPT when I signed up for it. And I was actually one of the first 10,000 public ChatGPT users. I'm proud of that. I believe that was the moment in history. Um, and so that really reignited my passion for machine learning. In early 2023, I was watching a lot of Shark Tank. I've always been an advocate of small business and a fan of small business and Shark Tank, quite frankly. I couldn't help but notice this common theme of whether it be a hot dog stand or an umbrella company or a baby blanket company. All of these businesses, in my opinion, could benefit from artificial intelligence, and none of them had the access to do so. The vision for AI integrations was born. I would spend the next six to eight months developing dozens and dozens of software solutions for dozens of businesses, primarily using the OpenAI API and starting to explore other different APIs. API, I'll de that for you as well. It's application programming interface. It's a way for me to interact with complex computer softwares like OpenAI. And then in October of 2023, the vision for AI integrations was 100% solidified. When I watched a TED talk from Dr. Andrew Ng, we're gonna play three short clips of this TED talk here this morning. Um, it was foundational in our business, and I'm sure you'll see why here in a bit. About two weeks after that TED talk, I saw OpenAI's first ever dev day. Dev days are when big tech companies like Microsoft, Google, Apple, et cetera, have a specific day where they show the developer or software engineer community how to use their products for the year to come. OpenAI being the big boy on the block with AI, so to speak, had their dev day and kind of laid out their roadmap for what they see as the next year of AI integrations for businesses, both big and small. And that was really motivational for us here at AI integrations. And then in 2011, or sorry, <laughs> And early up, uh, in January of 2024, the OpenAI GPT store launched. And we were proud to say that we are a verified OpenAI GPT builder domain. That means that we are allowed to publicly sell GPTs in the OpenAI GPT store. <laughs> we are one. Uh, we were we debuted five GPTs in the first 72 hours, and we are again very proud of this as we believe this will be a moment we look back on in history. We've worked with many businesses, some of which being Pueblo based and. Uh, a mutual connection of Jeff and I, we've recently launched American Driving Academy AI, where American Driving is able to streamline their conversations. And again, not replace that human interaction, but save 70, 80% of those questions that they would rather not be answering, quite frankly. And then now here in April, 2024, I'm excited to share my uh, knowledge on artificial intelligence with you all. Let's talk about the global AI landscape and where the AI environment is today. I'd like to start off this slide by saying I used artificial intelligence to mine thousands and thousands of statistics on AI so I could find the coolest AI stats. With that said, I went and verified all of these statistics. That's gonna be an important theme here with artificial intelligence, with important data, trust, but verification. So all of these statistics are coming from either the Small Business Council or Salesforce.com. One of the most astounding statistics to me was that 92% of S&P 500 companies are using some form of custom-coded artificial intelligence right now. I don't know of many things that 92% of S&P 500 companies have in common. Maybe taxes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so the big tech seven on that note are obviously a part of the S&P 500. The big tech seven being Amazon, Meta, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and Tesla. These companies' number one R&D expense across the board and by a significant margin for the past few years has been artificial intelligence. Just this morning, I saw that Google is spending $100 billion developing an AI data center somewhere in Northern Nevada. It is their number one expense. The AI service market was valued at roughly $136 billion in the year of 2022. And it's expected to grow to 1.8 trillion by the year of 2030. That's roughly a 1,200% increase. That projection is not due to a lack of demand. The product is good and people are liking it. 60% of enterprises have increased investment in AI in 2024. So that means they're liking what they see and they want to double down on it. That's what we like to hear. 
Small businesses saved an estimated $273.5 billion last year, thanks to artificial intelligence. That is no small number. 43% of small businesses said the most significant factor when choosing whether to use AI in their business or not is ease of access to that integration. It is a complex endeavor. And that was, again, part of the foundational framework of AI integrations. And then 83% of small business owners said they plan to maintain or increase their investments into AI this year. This to me paints a clear picture of the global AI landscape. AI is rising in that exponential rate. So I mentioned that TED talk earlier. Um, this TED talk is from Dr. Andrew Ng. He's one of the biggest names in Silicon Valley that nobody knows. Dr. Andrew Ng is actually the head of the computer science board at Stanford. That means that most of Silicon Valley's famous tech CEOs from Uber to DoorDash to Stripe to Snapchat have actually learned how to code from Dr. Andrew Ng here. Um, Dr. Andrew Ng is a Google Brain founder. <clears throat> that means that Dr. Andrew Ng is a part of Google's AI department. So we have him to thank for everything from Google Maps to Google Search and now Google Gemini. Dr. Andrew Ng is a Coursera co-founder and a deep learning founder, deep learning.ai founder. Here at AI Integrations, this is paramount to us. It shows that he is committed to democratizing AI technology. He is not trying to keep secrets and he is trying to make this information as accessible to everyone as possible. He is widely regarded as one of the forefront AI visionaries. And he has been interviewed on everything from TED to Forbes to MSNBC to Fox. With that said, I'd like to uh, give you a, sh a short quote from Andrew Ng to set the mood, and then we're going to play our first clip from Dr. Andrew Ng. AI is the new electricity. Just as electricity has transformed industries from agriculture to transportation to communication and manufacturing, AI will do the same. The one thing I couldn't figure out was how to make these auto play. <laughs> it makes us feel better knowing we struggle with that as well. <laughs> Certain tech things. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. I'm just going to do this. No pressure. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> our point's hard. We all got our four tasks. <laughs> Sometimes it's the meeting that we can do. It's got to be yeah. optimized for motion. And that's what I think. I don't know if we optimized it. Uh, so it'll play if you bring it up like on the website. So we should have figured out where the audio is going to come out of too. <laughs> One of the better things that I decided to do in my adult life was to see a therapist. If like me, you suffer in silence. When I think about the rise of AI, I'm reminded by the rise of literacy. A few hundred years ago, many people in society thought that maybe not everyone needed to be able to read and write. Back then, many people were attending fields or very sheep, so maybe there was less need for written communication. And all that was needed was for the high priests and priestesses and monks to be able to read the holy book. 
and the rest of us could just go to the temple or church or holy building and sit and listen to the high priest and priestess of the Eucharist. Fortunately, we have since figured out that we can build a much richer society if lots of people can read and write. So, short clip, I worked better when I had the idea of the embed. Sorry for that. Let's get this back up. Uh, I guess we're going to be referencing this two more times. <clears throat> all the way so cool. All right, and we're back, folks. <laughs> so you just heard Dr. Andrew and G talk for a one minute about how AI has been in the hands of the high priests and priestesses. I'd like to talk about the ways that we currently are benefiting from artificial intelligence in our day-to-day -day lives and some of the ways that these high priests and priestesses have taken advantage of this technology. Siri and Alexa have been around for over a decade now. Siri debuting in 2011 and Alexa in 2014. I'm sure we can all remember the original Siri not being able to set a timer properly or even do two timers. And now we have the advancements in AI to thank for the increased usefulness in Siri and Alexa. Google Maps, I think Google Maps and Apple Maps is one of the most overlooked forms of AI that we as humans use every single day. It was not that long ago where you'd have to print out a map quest and make on the on the fly decisions about, hmm, there's a traffic jam, maybe I have to get off the highway. Well, I'm off my map quest now, what do I do? That's no longer a problem in our lives thanks to artificial intelligence. Google search, Google search, a lot of people don't think of this as an artificial intelligence, but I, I'm here to tell you it is. Google will show different information to different people in the same location. Why is that? It's based upon the variables of, the, of who you are, meaning it's taking into account who you are, your likes, your emails, all this data they have on you, being the massive company that Google is. They take into account all of that when showing you your Google search. Yes. Have you found the DuckDuckGo search engines to be the same? Or what, what, what's your experience with that? So, most of the search engines, I mean, in any business, they need to make money somehow, right? Like that, they have to get paid. So most of the search engines are going to be selling your data. Yeah. I will say that stuff like DuckDuckGo isn't selling it. They don't have the client list that Google has, you know? So Ford might not be able to buy your data as easily from DuckDuckGo as it is Google. And I guess that's what I would say on that. Oh, the, the other question was about the showing selected data. Yes. To people. So um, we know Google does this, but yeah. the other search engines that claim to do it, have you found that they do it in the way? I haven't done a ton of research. I can tell you they are all using similar algorithms that are taking things into account, like your search history, like your likes. They they want to show, I mean, it's it's in good interest a lot of the time to show you what is the most relevant data to yourself. <clears throat> but sometimes that can lead astray as we were kind of talking about. Yeah, thank you. Of course. And thank you for the question. I'm more than happy to do that. Sweet. So now let's talk about the Instagram algorithm on the note algorithms that know too much about us. So the Instagram algorithm, indeed, Meta's value is not. So Meta is one of the most valuable companies in the S&P 500 right now. I'm here to tell you that's not because they developed an app. It's the algorithm behind the app. <laughs> The algorithm behind the app is able to know what captivates our human attention better than sometimes us as humans. We all know what this has done to society, and we all know the amount of money they have made selling Instagram and Facebook ads. I'm sure some of us use them very effectively on my app. It's the most targeted marketing possible due to that exact same reason. But that is a common way that we are interacting with AI in our everyday lives. Additionally, I'm sure we've all been looking at our phone or computer and seen an Amazon product recommendation and thought, Wow, how did they know I want that thing? Well, the answer to that is artificial intelligence. Amazon and Costco are some of the biggest logistics and shipping businesses in the United States right now. Both of these businesses have publicly accredited artificial intelligence for streamlining their logistics and supply chains many times and are both heavily, heavily invested in increasing the artificial intelligence aiding of their supply chains. I like to say it's part of the reason we can get stuff so darn cheap on Amazon, so darn cheap at Costco, is because they use AI to streamline that logistics process. Again, Tesla self-driving is a way that we might, uh, that we're currently exposed to and interacting with AI. I would like to mention that Tesla self-driving might seem like a cool gimmick for now. A few applications of it that you might not have thought of, 
I believe that Tesla self-driving will disrupt the Uber industry the way that Uber disrupted the cab. And I believe that Tesla's self-trucking, which is correlated to the self-driving technology, will make land-based shipping exponentially cheaper. These are here in the near future. Yes. What would you say to people who, when you mention that, just open and tell you, no, that would never happen. You would never, ever be able to do without human truck drivers and logistics. What, what would you say? I would say in 1997, those same people thought we couldn't beat uh, the world chess champion at chess. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, I'm sure we've all heard of NVIDIA. NVIDIA is one of the most valuable companies on the stock market right now. And if you could time travel 10 years back in time, NVIDIA would be about the best investment you could have humanly made. I'd like to explain why that is the case. NVIDIA is the hardware manufacturer for all of these AI chips, for lack of a better term. Every company I've just mentioned pays NVIDIA money for chips that allow these AIs to run. So next time you see NVIDIA's stock price, I don't want you thinking, wow, that's some weird tech company I don't use. Why are they so expensive? I want you thinking, oh, they're the man behind the curtain of all this AI stuff, and that's why it's so expensive. Awesome, another clip time. <laughs> 550 should be easier. Let's go around. Yep. So we might be asking ourselves, like, why haven't we seen more AI in small business on the screen? Here? There we go. <laughs> why haven't we seen more AI in small business yet? I think this is because of the long tail problem of AI. And I'd like to let Dr. Andrew and Angie elaborate and find what the long tail problem of AI is. Which means fast forwarding to like right there. <clears throat> Large tech companies routinely use AI to solve problems like these and to great effect. But a typical t shirt company or a typical auto mechanic or retailer or school or local farm will be using AI for exactly zero of these applications today. Every t-shirt maker is sufficiently different from every other t-shirt maker that there is no one size fits all AI that will work for all of them. And in fact, once you go outside the internet and tech sectors, in other industries, even large companies, such as the pharmaceutical companies, the car makers, the hospitals, also struggle with this. This is the long tail problem of AI. If you were to take all current and potential AI projects and sort them in decreasing order of value and plot them, you get graph that looks like this. Maybe the single most valuable AI system is something that decides what ads to show people on the internet, Maybe the second most valuable is a web search engine. Maybe the third most valuable is an online shopping product recommendation system. But when you go to the right of this curve, you then get projects like t-shirt product placements or t-shirt demand forecasting or pizza rear demand forecasting. And each of these is a unique project that needs to be custom built. Even t-shirt demand forecasting, if it depends on trending memes on, the, on social media, there's a very different project than pizzeria um, demand forecasting, but that depends on the pizzeria sales data. So today, there are millions of projects sitting on the tail of this distribution that no one is working on, but whose aggregate value is massive. So this is the moment in this TED talk that really I would like to say has changed my life. There is a massive amount of AI projects that are just not being worked on. It's estimated that roughly 90% of AI software engineers work for one of those big tech seven companies. That is 90% of the developing talent. We are committed to democratizing AI technology by providing you guys access to the same technology. Let me go back to the slideshow real quick. It's off the right. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, this was a foundational moment for AI integrations. AI integrations is committed to democratizing AI technology to make it as accessible and as powerful a tool for small businesses to enhance their operations, drive growth, and streamline the decision-making process as possible. AI integrations works closely with our clients to identify the pain point that you want to solve with AI. Again, as Dr. Andrew Ng was saying, not every solution is the same. T-shirt demand forecasting at one store could be very different than another. So we want to work closely with you to 
identify that pain point. And then we want to build the AI that is the most cost-effective and scalable AI possible. Most small businesses have aspirations of growing. We would like your AI to be able to grow with you, but we would like for it to not break the bank in the beginning. Because if you hired seven meta AI engineers, that would be very expensive. So last flip time. There we go. Go back actually. I would encourage you to watch this whole video. I hope that at a minimum you get excited to watch this video. Million people want to generate comparable economics. Let me illustrate an example. Many weekends, I drive a few minutes from my house to a local pizza store to buy a slice of Hawaiian pizza from the gentleman that owns this pizza store. Um, and his pizza is great, but he always has a lot of cold pizza sitting around, and every weekend, some different flavor of pizza is out of stock. But when I watch him operate the store, I get excited because by selling pizza, he is generating data. And this is data that he could take advantage of if he had access to AI. AI systems are good at spotting patterns when given access to the right data. And perhaps an AI system could spot if Mediterranean pizzas sell really well on a Friday night, maybe it could suggest to him to make more of it on a Friday afternoon. Now you might say to me, hey, Andrew, this is a small pizza store. What's the big deal? And I say to the gentleman that owns this pizza store, something that could help him improve his revenues by a few thousand dollars a year, that will be a huge deal to him. To apply, to apply, to apply to 100 million people <laughs> to raise comparable economics. Oh. Let me illustrate an example. <laughs> um, many weekends, I go a few minutes from my house to a local pizza store to buy a slice of Hawaiian pizza from the gentleman that owns this pizza store. All righty. <laughs> YouTube efforts over. <laughs> Where's my mouse? Go back to my screen. Sweet. What is this? Or what's his last name? Literally, in G. In G. I had to double check. That is actually how you're supposed to pronounce it as well. N G. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get this slideshow back up. And we are now here. So I'm sure you don't want to just stand here and listen about AI. If you want to actually interact with it and learn how we can use it in our business, right? That's why we're all here this morning. With that said, I would like for anyone who wants to, you can take your smartphone. If you have Android on the left, use the QR code on the left, iOS on the right, QR code on the right. That'll take you to the official uh, OpenAI chat GPT app. I would like to say on a data security standpoint, there is a massive flood on the app store of non-official AI apps. I would recommend using open AI. And I'm going to give you a 30 seconds, let everyone make sure we kind of get it, get it open potentially. It's not the end of the world if you don't, but kind of helps to follow along for this next little segment. Cool, and, simple, and this is going to take you to an interface very similar to what Jeff showed you earlier this morning for those of us that haven't used ChatGPT yet. Cool. With this in mind, I want to talk about prompt engineering. I'm sure we've heard in the news recently prompt engineers making ridiculous money at X tech company. Prompt engineering is simply a fancy way of saying you have a, you conscientiously are deciding what input you want to put into an AI in order to get a desired output. For example, a simple prompt engineering formula I would like to show you guys today for use is the role plus task equals goal formula. You can see here, I say act as a social media coordinator, act as an SEO specialist. This is the role for the AI. This will give it the background knowledge to further know how to perform its task. Next, you'll see the task. Perform content creation for the upcoming product launch by giving me three Instagram caption posts about this product launch. Or, and then optimize our main product page. That would be the task on the second one. And then you see the goal. Our goal is to increase engagement and awareness about the new product. 
Our goal is to secure top search ranking and increase organic traffic and lead generation. So you've now specified to the AI the role of the AI, the task of what the AI is supposed to be doing, and the ideal outcome of that task. A little caveat to this, and this is a personal tip, I always like to ask the AI to ask me questions. So at the end of the prompt, I'm gonna go, ask me any questions you may need to best perform this task. A lot of the time the AI is gonna go, well, what, what kind of social media campaign do you, you know? Like it'll ask you some really good, insightful questions. And I think that spending the time to answer three or four of those questions will greatly, greatly, greatly improve your output. Does anyone have any questions about this? Spencer, can I stop you for yeah. just one second? All right, everyone, this is going to go over um, a little bit of time. Catherine and I have to get on the road because we have to be in Walsenburg, but we wanted to thank you for coming. We wanted to thank our sponsors, Chapa, she's, she's left too, she had to get going, KDZA, All Access Accounting, and PB&T Bank. This is a really valuable tool. If you haven't used ChatGPT yet, it's something that you definitely want to figure out. It can save you so much time. If I knew about ChatGPT three years ago when I was writing all these grant things and spent hours and hours on writing grants, I would have had tons more grants <laughs> with ChatGPT because it's just so easy. It helps your writing. It makes you, um, some of my colleagues use it because it makes their emails sound nicer. Some of them sound more professional. They get new ideas and different things that are happening. So it's definitely a great tool to learn. But again, thank you for coming. We hope to see you at other events, but I'm going to let you finish. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> on that note, I'll speed this up and we can skip over the breakout session. I plan on giving you guys any feedback if you want to try some prompt engineering. I don't see too many hands typing, so we'll skip over that. <laughs> All right, let's briefly mention what kind of AI ecosystems that are currently being developed for small businesses, both by my company and other companies like mine. AI chat and custom LLMs are kind of the current go-to as they're the most obvious, cost-effective, and simplest use case to implement. When I say AI chat and custom LLMs, I want you to think of Siri, Alexa, or ChatGPT that knows everything about your business. Most businesses aren't big enough for these AIs to know about them. I mean, if you're Ford, you can ask ChatGPT about Ford, but you say, hey, my bakery here in Pueblo, Colorado, ChatGPT is going to know nothing about that. So what I do is I build versions of AIs that know everything about your business and it allows your customers to interact with an AI that knows, again, everything about your business. We'll talk a little more about, a bit about that in a second. Um, and then, then, again, just to speed up, some ideas that people are systems we've built and ideas that people are currently working on for AI to maximize efficiency in small business, inventory management, demand forecasting, and accounting. All three of these things are typically done with spreadsheets and mathematics. These spreadsheets and mathematics can greatly, greatly, greatly benefit from the uh, intertwining of artificial intelligence. Ironically to me, social media marketing is more complex than computer code. So for someone like myself, having an AI to help with Instagram captions and research like that is phenomenal. Supply chain optimization. You don't need to be Costco to benefit from using AI to have supply chain optimization. I'm sure all of you buy products, whether it be styrofoam cups or t-shirts or whatever you may buy. And I'm sure that there's hundreds of different vendors for those products. You can use AI to see which vendor is selling it cheapest and when. And then finally, quality control. This is one of the more futuristic uh, technologies that is currently being implemented. But things like large farms in Kentucky have AIs on or have a camera on the bottom of a plane that flies over a field of crops, and it's using artificial intelligence to identify what part of the crop might go bad and help do that sooner to prevent crop loss. Same thing with t-shirt inspection. Many factories are now using artificial intelligence to look for a blown stitch on a t-shirt coming across the assembly line or something like that. Cool. Briefly, just want to touch on AI chat. AI chat's a really impressive product. AI chat is, again, that Siri or Alexa that's able to interact with your customers on the website. AI chat is responsive 24-7, 365, regardless of a queue as well. Another thing I'd like to say, human chat versus AI chat, if you have 10 customers who want your attention at once, as a human, we can only respond to one chat at once. The AI will treat every customer like they're the first customer, whether it be customer one or customer 1000 at that same exact moment in time. Our AI chat speaks 94 languages. This is astounding. I don't know a human on the face of the planet that can speak 94 languages. So this in and of itself is going to greatly increase 
the usability of your website's data. <clears throat> on that note, we have the ability to train on over 10 million characters of data. Let me humanize that for you. 10 million characters of data is roughly 3,000 pages of a collegiate textbook and or five copies of the DMV website. Again, I don't know many humans that could know everything from five copies of the DMV website or recite 3,000 pages of a collegiate textbook. This streamlined access to information is going to inherently boost SEO as some of the key SEO metrics that Google uses is retention rates and the amount of time spent on a page. And by increasing your users' access to information, they're going to inherently stay on the page longer because they're able to find the information they want and rather than just, oh, I couldn't find it and bounce. The classic example is the bigger the website gets, you might have to click through five, six pages to find that little bit of information on you know, when this product might launch or something like that. Today, you can have an AI chat in the bottom right corner of your website. It'll answer any question in one to two seconds. This is going to lead to higher conversion rates. Um, another stat I just want to throw out real quick. Recently, CNBC did a study and they compared human chats to AI chats. And when the human chat was online, this is a key caveat too, was online, it took an average of 11 minutes to resolve an issue. When the AI chat was online, I always, it took two to three minutes to resolve that same issue. And again, this is regardless of queuing. So we're familiar with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is the most common GPT. G GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, or, I, or the ability for an AI to interact with the real world by performing actions. We develop custom GPTs, AI integrations. These are some of them right here. Legal advice, email filtering, Instagram captions, coding, log monitoring, website advice, all of these things we have GPTs for internally here, AI integrations, and we've built them for other businesses. So to save time, I'm not going to dive into each one of these, but all these categories over on the left are categories that we have automated and will continue to automate with GPTs. Briefly, I'd just like to touch on the ways I use AI every day to kind of get the mind jogging and ways you can use AI in your everyday life, whether it be just for your business or in your personal life. I use AI for coding in cybersecurity. I think it's important to say that this is this acts as a draft writer. Imagine I was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. You're gonna have to potentially draft an article that you're gonna then refine and write. That is the way I use AI to code. AI will do about 60 to 70% of what I call the grunt work of coding. I have the easy stuff and then I have to go in and refine it. And I think that's a common theme on these more critical integrations currently. Um, yeah, I'll just skip all these are pretty self-explanatory and been touched on before. If we have any questions after we can go to it, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over this. Cool. I wanna talk about where I see AI going in the future at the end of this presentation. Hopefully I don't scare anyone on this slide. If I do, feel free to talk to me at the end. I'm not trying to scare any of you. Voice chat. I think, well, I know currently the chain, Carlos Juniors and Hardy's, is debuting in certain pilot test locations, AI drive throughs So rather than having a human in your drive through you have an AI that is so good that most humans cannot tell that it is an AI. This AI is able to take orders and do everything that your traditional drive through would do. That is being debuted and tested at many chains, Hardy's and Carlos Juniors being one of them. I believe in a similar fashion, here in the next year or two, you'll be able to call a pizza store, and if the pizza store wants and is invested in the technology, you can place an order for your delivery pizza solely through an automation. This might sound a little dystopian to some of us. I'd like to point out that if on a Friday night that pizza store has got a backlog of 30 calls and you're a customer that needs to wait 20, 30 minutes to even talk to someone to place your pizza order, you're going to very much prefer talking to that artificial intelligence and getting that instantaneous customer service regardless of the language you speak. I believe that websites will start to become less of these monstrous things of 800 page websites. And I believe this will start to be condensed into say a five page site with five different AIs that specialize in five different things. Again, this is just streamlining the user's access to that information. Furthermore, if Mark Zuckerberg and Meta have their way, there will be a metaverse one day. And in that metaverse, I believe these same AIs that are meant to represent your business on the internet right now could be paired with a 3D avatar in the metaverse to represent your business in the metaverse. Yes, I do think you'd be able to order a pizza through an AI avatar in the metaverse sometime in the next five years. Sounds crazy. 
On that note, I believe that these professions are going to see increased AI integrations. I don't believe that we're going to have full AI accountants, lawyers, secretary, or software engineers anytime soon. But I do believe that these industries will start to become more and more AI dominated, where again, 70% of the work might be done by an AI and 20 to 30% as a human oversight in these industries. And yes, that includes software engineers. AI is indeed coming for my job too. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then finally, I believe that supply chain and inventory management will be one of the final or one of the first major sectors of business to be fully automated. Again, these are traditionally done with spreadsheets and large numbers. So that is something that I believe will be one of the first parts of business to be fully AI automated. I'd like to end by talking about two cool AI products that are being designed right now. I found while researching for this presentation, currently there's a company designing an AI interior design app that allows you to take a picture of something like a living room and you can change the paint on the walls. You can change the flooring. You can remove that couch. You can even take a picture of your couch and put it in that room to see how your furniture is going to look in that room, how your paint would look on that wall, how your flooring is going to look. I'm sure everyone in this room can appreciate the real estate implications of an application with that. Additionally, companies like Nike and Adidas are working on AI outfitters. So you, I think sometime in the next year or two, you'll be able to go on a major apparel brand's website and rather than being, hmm, how does a small or a medium fit me? You'll be able to scan your body somehow with your phone. And it'll show you how that t-shirt will fit you in particular. <laughs> Let's talk about some challenges real quick. Um, I'll just briefly touch on these data security. One of the biggest concerns with AI is data security. Um, data security is at the utmost priority here at AI integrations and with most AI companies. A lot of our expense as a company comes from simply keeping your data secure. Um, Ethical AI is a really important thing. There are US-based companies. Uh, most big tech companies in the US have some form of ethical guidelines. There are businesses that are doing basically free range AI. And as a company, we don't work with those businesses and we don't encourage you to use those kinds of AIs. The democratization of AI, I think is a key challenge we're facing as a society right now, not necessarily as a, an individual, but as a society. I think that AI has been in the hands of the high priests and priestesses and these big tech companies for 15 years now. And your everyday jail and your everyday business has not been using artificial intelligence. If we continue the trend, we are going to allow them to get such a big lead that we will not be able to catch up, so to speak. I would like to say that AI integrations, we specifically think that AI is for aiding human interactions, not replacing it. I know I talked about, you know, the future jobs. These are long things off. I just want to kind of get your brain rolling into like where the future might go. We're not replacing any jobs with AI today. On that note, we believe responsible use of artificial intelligence is incredibly important. I've seen the development of these technologies over the past three years come miles. Um, yeah, I'm sure we've seen some scary memes and stuff of what ChatGPT was doing the first couple months of it being open. And OpenAI realized that they need to, you know, put some restrictions and reins on it. More than one to chat about that afterwards if you'd like as well. All right, I promise this is the last slide. <laughs> I believe we are at a key moment in history right now. I believe in the 1990s, a lot of people didn't appreciate that they were living in the internet and dot-com boom. And at this moment in history, will be looked back on forever. The internet changed humanity and our access to information. Furthermore, I believe the app and smartphone boom boom, has changed humanity humanity, and our access to information. We now have everything at the tips of our fingers. However, I personally believe AI will be exponentially more impactful than both of these tech terms. I know that's a claim. On that note, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Meta, recently did a podcast at the beginning of this month. I would love to link you guys to it after this presentation if you're interested in listening. He said, the AI boom will be the biggest advance in technology since the invention of the computer. With that, I'd like to open the floor to any questions you all might have. Anyone? <laughs> Unfortunately, what we hear so much in the news is the data breach of 140 million this and 75,000 that. Yeah. Check and see whether you've been hacked and, and it it makes you stop and think turning your business information over to this thing. Yeah. 
Um, how do you make, or can you make AI secure? How, how do you make your business secure? That is that part of adding AI to what you do, the security part? Uh, that's a big part of our concern here. I, I will say it's like any adding any information digitally, whether it be to an AI, to a website, to an Instagram, to your Gmail, whatever it may be, it's all the same level of vulnerability in, this, in the sense of it's vulnerable because it's out there. Now, once it's out there, you do what you can to protect it in the sense that Gmail has a lot of your sensitive business information as well, I'm sure, or your email choice, uh, provider of choice. They simply have to secure that information. I'd like to say that AI is the same thing. And even on that note, for the use case of publicly facing AI, so like specifically the AI chat and web facing one, 90% of the data we're going to be training on is data that you want publicly facing as is. It's things that you've already handed out in flyers. It's things that are on your website. So that 10%, let's say that you are like, hey, I want the AI to know this, but I don't want the user, my client to know this. We take extra care in the security of that data. But I would say that probably 90% of the data that the AI is being trained off of is publicly facing as it is. And sometimes 100, it really just depends upon the business use case. Because I mean, if you think about it, because the AI is a publicly facing, it, when it becomes internal for inventory management and logistics, that becomes a different manner. However, those aren't exposed to the internet in kind of the same way as the other AIs either. Because then if it's internally, you're not posting it online, you use it. And on your computer, the vulnerabilities go down as well. Um, it is a very important topic, and I'm actually a Google cybersecurity professional, and that kind of led to some of my passion with all this. Yes? What is the probability you see AI being used maliciously, like when there's a data hack, and they just plug your data into an AI to, to find out, you know, how to... 100% if I'm honest. I think that any technology has been used maliciously throughout time. Mm -hmm. So would you see this as a bigger threat or do you, do you think there'll be other AI to combat the AI that's using your data? So that's already <laughs> happening right now. Okay. Palo Alto Networks is like the biggest cybersecurity firm, a lot like Google, Google, Apple, Google, Apple, Microsoft, all these companies outsource a lot of their cybersecurity to a company called Palo Alto Networks. Their number one R&D expense as well for the past few years has been artificial intelligence. And if you go on their website, it is just AI everything. And I do believe that is the way cybersecurity is going. It'll be our AI versus their AI, effectively. Good question. Yes. How do you deal with hallucinating? Hallucinating, very good question. So that is gonna be based upon the data training and the manual overrides. So in the context of an AI chat, a publicly facing one like our website, we have an override where if it doesn't, so. I use a mathematical score to basically give every response a confidence rating, if that kind of makes sense. So it can be rated like one to 10, like 10 out of 10, we're sure, yes, two plus two equals four. Or one out of 10, no, I can't tell you the meaning of life, you know? And so I work with the business owner to put kind of a stop loss in there or a block and say, hey, anything under seven, we say, hmm, I'm sorry, please contact the business. And so that is an issue. That's our way of combating it. I think that inherently, it, it'll be a long time before that ends is completely solved, quite frankly. And that's way, but that's like the guy making millions of dollars of open AI as AI engineers. That's, um, yeah. Did that answer that question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes. Since I think I'm 99.9% .9 sure I'm the oldest guy in the room. Yeah. Um, I went to school in Fort Collins back in the 70s, yeah. and I remember punch cards. What a freaking nightmare. You had a punch card system this thick, and you had one hanging Chad uh, that would just screw up the whole program. Then we saw the advent of, of something they called a computer. <laughs> then they, then they, you know, the big thing was now we can actually go in the science building and tie into the math building. Oh my God. But it would take 20 minutes to log in. Yeah. Then, you know, I think uh, I, I sold books during the summer to put my way through college. And we sold one big book, 3,000 page book that replaced the Encyclopedia Britannica for families that couldn't afford it. For $50, you could buy this one book that 
and basically consolidated all this information from the encyclopedias yeah. into one book so a family could afford this book. <clears throat> I have that book in my office today, yep. in 1976. I look at that book and now I look at my phone and I go, all of that is here plus a gazillion times more. Correct. This scares the hell out of me. Why? <laughs> it's exciting. It is also because all that stuff, you know, that big, huge book that, that I find fascinating to go ahead and look and, and read this stuff in here, all of that's right here. And somebody pointed out, it was really good, this young man pointed out to Pam and I, look at the back of your iPhone. Somebody got an iPhone, look at the back of it. What's on there? The Apple. The Apple. What about the Apple that's unique? It's got a bike taken it's out of it. It's got a bike taken out of it. What's that represent? Lots of things. <laughs> to me, that represents Adam and Eve. The bite out of the apple. Temptation. In your phone, and I don't want to get biblical too much, yeah. but God said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of right and wrong. Or you may find out that not everything's right, not everything's wrong. But the, the thing about the apple that they bit into the apple, that's temptation. In your phone is the is knowledge, but there's also a bunch of crap in there, temptation. And what you're talking about, is this going to be used for bad? Hell yeah. Oh, yeah. Nuclear energy used for bad? Yes. But there's a lot of good things about nuclear energy. There's a, you know, there throughout history, the cotton gin came along and people thought, oh my God, it's going to be it's going to put a lot of people out of work. Yeah, it put slaves out of work. You know, the technology can be incredibly good or bad, but you better get on board. Yeah, you know, it's happening with yeah. about anyone in this room. Yeah, and you know, I'm sitting here going, I don't mind getting on board. I'm going to hire somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I want, I want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Real quick, can I promise? Real quick, I got my identity stolen last week. Okay. So sorry to hear that. It was kind of my fault. Um, looking mm -hmm. back at it, the guy called said he was from T-Mobile and he was trying to help me from my account getting hacked by someone who couldn't buy a phone. Mm -hmm. So I thank the guy over and over again. The, the, where I'm going with this is that so the guy that was on the phone with me, number one, gained my trust. Number two, um, I gave him all the information so he didn't have to hack into my account. I gave him my codes and stuff and yeah. they were past popping up. Then they took my phone number. They had my name, my address, my business name, my federal ID number, my kids' names. My, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So then, this whole week, I've been a paranoid freak. I'm just going to tell you. Thank you, Jesus. We got the uh, T Mobile did help me get my phone number back, nice. but they couldn't guarantee it that day. So now I've been scared to death. Well, well, I don't want to say that, but. I think everything is okay, and I think we stopped the bleeding and stopped everything and logged out with blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But this AI thing really concerns me, too, because I'm thinking I willingly gave this guy information that I shouldn't have, and then I'm wondering how many other times I've done that, and it's out there. And then so then I was getting these notices that said it was pain, and they were trying to get into my account in Germany, China, Florida, New York. Yep. And was that true or was that just a, some, it was on Google. I was like, oh my God, I had this thing. So those notices are, uh, depending on your provider, but that was a Google like AI monitoring of logs. So on the note of log monitoring I talked about earlier with an AI, it's going, hey, I, I don't know your name, but X person usually doesn't hang out in Germany on a Tuesday. Why is there a login attempt and that AI is identifying an outlier? Um, I will say on a cybersecurity note, I encourage everyone in this room to use commas in your passwords. I don't need to go into like a nerdy version of why, but it makes it exponentially harder for someone to hack your password. So comma in your password, free fun tip of the day, not related to AI. A comma. The reason for that is that it reads an individual. Okay. So you have it in your password. I got an exclamation, but I didn't know the context. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, Grace, CSV now, everybody knows. Yeah. That's 80% of the passwords are packed with CSV files. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, before we run out of time, I just wanted um, everyone to know if they want to see how Spencer's work could benefit your business, again, uh, one of his products is that AI chat. 
And if you go to Pueblo Web Design under the Web Design tab, give it a test. And um, it, it's, it's really affordable. And he customizes everything for your businesses, monitors it, teaches it as it grows, it, or it gains knowledge. And um, I'd say give it a test. It's much more affordable than you probably think. Thank you. I appreciate that. And on that note, too, uh, I will, I'd love to hand out business cards to anybody who's interested. If you go on my website, you'll see a, a carousel of companies we work with. And I encourage you, I did some fancy computer coding, so they don't get billed for when um, the traffic comes from my website. So I do bill a small amount per message with these AI bots when you use them. So I specifically set up computer code to where you can test any of my clients' AIs on my website and they will not be billed, but it allows you to see, hey, Fujiyama Sushi, AI can tell you that this restaurant should, you know, have food allergies or when the half off special is, or, you know, how do I book a driving exam with American Driving Academy? Or, you know, is this blanket environmentally friendly? And any question you could consider about your business. Um, yeah. And any further questions? I hope I didn't. See. Yes. How does it how does it differentiate from just being a regular search? Because I've been playing with Chat, chat GPT Copilot, and it yeah. seems to just all it does is spit out other websites. To me. So yeah, it does, but it's efficiently sorting through those websites in a sense. So on Google search, you have to manually identify which link you want to go to, and then in the article look for the bit of information that's relevant. It's so like for example, like. How do I change the oil in my car? Let's pretend you Google that. It's going to take you to like AutoZone's website. And then on AutoZone's website, there's going to be a tab where like how to change your oil. And then within that, the information is there. So it's the same information, but it's saving you those three or four steps of having to find the AutoZone website, go to the tab, figure out what part of the article. And it's also typically cross verifying it against other things. So if O'Reilly and 50 other auto parts stores say, no, that's not how you change oil. If AutoZone does, the AI is going to take the 49 rep. And so that inherently, too, is going to kind of help verify accuracy of information. Does that kind of help answer the question a little bit? So I just, like I said, I've been, I was playing around with trying to figure out how to do uh, reverse proxies. And okay. it, just, it just basically spitting out their websites to me. I was just like, well, I can go to the website and read it myself. I yeah. get more out of it. <laughs> so I would encourage you to use that role plus task equals goal with the ask me questions style of prompting when you do that. If you say, hey, act as a network engineer, teach me about reverse proxies within my system, it's probably going to be a little more helpful. But yeah, um, any further questions? Cool. I'd like to end on a motivational <laughs> note, I guess, and a positive note with AI. I think I might have been a little too scary with some of that tech here at the end. Sam Altman and OpenAI is one of the biggest nonprofits in the United States currently. Their goal is to solve human disease with artificial intelligence. That is how they got designated as a nonprofit by the government. They have partnered with businesses like Moderna and Pfizer and are using artificial intelligence to do R&D testing on drugs that don't even exist yet to kind of open your mind to possibilities for ways that it could very well benefit society. Like for example, literally curing cancer. We, uh, my wife and I went to New York uh, a couple of weeks, two years ago. We went through some extensive precision diagnostics. I went, I had cancer three years ago and she's battling some arthritis issues. So we decided to take, uh, it wasn't cheap, but it was absolutely incredible. We went through um, MRIs, uh, CAT scans, et cetera, all attached to AI. Mm -hmm. And when we did, when we did the follow-up, uh, basically it was a follow-up with the doctor on a Zoom call, they were able to, for example, go into my heart and literally do take me inside my own heart and go through every valve, and then you could see everything. You could see there's a little yeah. calcium blockage over here. You've got 31% blockage here. We need to keep an eye on here. You got a little thickening here. And they, they run the, everything through the AI and they can tell you what your risk factors are going in the future. Mm -hmm. I, my family's getting had up. strokes, et cetera. And, and, then she found out that the medication that they had her on for RA, because of what they did, they were able to find out that genetically she was not absorbing the medication properly and it was becoming toxic in her system. She'd been on that for two and a half years with an arthritis specialist in Denver 
With one test, they found out, oh, no, 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 you don't take that medicine because your body cannot absorb that. And so that's why she was feeling really crappy every time she took it. She was getting a toxic reaction. And uh, in regular medication, what they do, they just hand you a pill to say, take this, take this. It's from L and air versus the calculated decision. Exactly. And uh, then we found, you know, we hooked up with this doctor out of San Antonio just recently, and we sent all that information to him, and he's... He's a functional doctor, but he was looking at that information and goes, oh my God, where'd you get this? <laughs> he goes, this is incredible. This is state of the art. And it's, it was, uh, he was very, very impressed. Problem was, I'm not going to hope there's no doctors in here. We've got the doctors here locally taking that information in. We spent a lot of money on it. Now, I don't need to see it. Yeah. What do you mean you don't need to see it? Yeah. This they, they don't know because it's so far beyond. You know, well, that's I didn't learn that in medical school. The pharmaceutical company didn't teach me that. All they want to do is hand you the medicine. And here we are walking in with a tool saying, This is a tool that you should be looking at because this talks about me personally. They don't want to see it. Yeah. And so that's the, you know, when you said AI is doing some things for healthcare, I can tell that. I've seen it. I've seen it in our own lives. It, it's, it's amazing when they hook up that 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 CAT scan, for example, or or the uh, CT scanner or uh, MRI to that. It's it just expands it dramatically. I think that's a great example of a very positive use case for artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Cool. Which, which one is yours? Which app was that? I didn't know what you. Which uh, I've got some business cards all hanging around for anyone who wants to get in touch with me on my website. You can also get in touch with me through Jeff. If you have a relationship with Jeff, work with Jeff, and then Jeff is a great guy. I'd recommend him for your website development. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is. That's one who did ours. Love to hear that. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, I'm going to hang out and I'd love to chat about anything nerdy and techy with you guys. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dutch.